Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's release of new data for the 100 largest cities and the National Equity Atlas. I'm Sarah Truhaft, Director of Equitable Growth Initiatives at PolicyLink, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. PolicyLink is a National Research and Action Institute advancing economic and social equity. The National Equity Atlas was created by a long-term partnership between PolicyLink and the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at the University of Southern California. Our partnership focuses on pro promoting a new narrative about why and how <laughs> racial equity and inclusion is both the right thing to do and the superior growth model for our nation as we become a majority people of color country. We work on the ground with community collaborations to help them assess their equity conditions and develop their own shared narratives and policy agendas. And we built the National Equity Atlas to democratize this data and put relevant information, visualizations, and policy ideas in your hands. So we are thrilled to be expanding the atlas to make it more useful for those of you working on city-level policy agendas for inclusive growth. Today's webinar uses the GoToMeeting platform. We will have about 20 minutes for Q&A after our presentation. So please go ahead and type in your questions into the question box that you see here at any time, and we'll be queuing them up to answer them. Also, please join the conversation on Twitter using the equity data hashtag. We have a terrific lineup of speakers. In a moment, I'll turn to Angela Glover Blackwell, founder and CEO of PolicyLink, to give opening remarks. We'll then hear from a big city mayor who is leading with a racial equity agenda and using this sort of data to inform her own initiatives. That's Mayor Betsy Hodges of Minneapolis. Then Manuel Pastor, director of PEER, will say a little more about the city data and our project. And then Tom, Pamela Stevens up here will walk you through the site, highlighting the new data, and then we'll open it up for questions. Now, here's Angela. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. I am so honored that we are doing this with co-sponsors. As you look at the co-sponsors on the screen, it is just so inspiring that this network of city leaders, including organizers, labor, elected government officials and community builders has come together to share this information with their networks. We look forward to continuing to work with the co-sponsors and all of you to advance racial economic inclusion and equitable growth in cities. It's exciting to release this data on cities because, as you all know, cities are ground zero for the fight for inclusion. They're also incubators for innovation. And innovation around equity and inclusion is what will really make cities strong and sustainable. Some of them are coming back. Some of them aren't yet coming back. But we know the key will be a focus on inclusion, racial equity, and economic vitality. Before I go any further, though, I want to make sure that all of you know that we will be launching our All In Cities campaign and initiative at the Equity Summit. I hope you're all registered, but if not, there's still time to get registered for the Equity 2015 Summit in Los Angeles at the Bonaventure Hotel, October 27th through 29th. And now I want to turn to Mayor Betsy Hodges to say more about how she is focused on using this data, focused on building an all-in city, and focused on being a partner to all of us as she leads a city that is incubating new ideas, acting on the a need to build a fully inclusive, equitable city. Dr. Um, Betsy Hodges, are you there? I sure am, Angela. Thank oh, you great. So much. It's nice to hear your voice. It's nice to hear yours, too. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I have three questions that are on my whiteboard in my office. Uh, one of them is, how does this help the city run well? One of them is, how does this move the dial on growth? And one of them is, how does this move the dial on equity? And everything I do is run through those three questions, but increasingly it's clear that those are essentially the same questions. We're growing the city only if we are growing it with everyone and for everyone. And we're only running the city well only if we're running it well for everybody. And that uh, a city run well depends on making sure we transform how we do the basics to work for everybody. Data is incredibly important underpinning for all of that work. Um, 
knowing what our uh, demographic trends and changes are uh, is very important. Um, for example, we recently learned in Minnesota that from 2013 to 2014, the median income for black households in the state fell 14%. In a state that already has some of the biggest gaps between white people and people of color, that's a significant thing to know. We know that enrollment in Minneapolis public schools, 70% of our students are students of color. 40% of our overall, overall population are people of color. So we know what the demographic trends are. We're going to be majority minority sooner rather than later in Minneapolis and in the state. And we need to make sure we are setting up our systems well so that everybody is prepared to contribute to and benefit from our growth and our prosperity. We can't stand still with the kinds of numbers that we have. So in the region, um, and you know, regions and cities need to be in the right place to address poverty and to address a lot of the issues that we're facing in terms of growth. Um, we are being called upon to have conversations about these important topics because of our capacity to make change. Um, you know, I am speaking to you from New York where I've been in UN talking about some of the factors that lead to violence in communities um, and working on climate change on an international level. People are increasingly turning to cities and to regions to make sure that we can do the work that we need to do. The reason data is important for me is twofold. First, it allows me to actually make the case that our growth needs to be inclusive growth. It allows me to say, this is where we are, this is where we're headed now, and that if we are preparing, for example, all of our young people to create and take the jobs of the future, we're not going to have the workforce we need, which is one of the strengths in Minneapolis and in Minnesota. We have 19 Fortune 500 companies. The only state with a larger concentration of Fortune 500 companies is Connecticut. We're doing that as the, the pipeline of educated folks mostly educated white kids, and that if we don't start educating our kids of color, we're not going to continue to grow, and in fact, we're going to move backwards. Making that case really clearly, using the kinds of data that I can get from the Atlas, has been incredibly, incredibly important. The second reason it's so crucial to have data is so that I know the kinds of strategies that I need to implement moving forward to be most effective to meet our universal growth goals. That if I know for example, that black median income has dropped 14% in the state and in my city, then I also know that I have to focus time, resource, and attention on making sure that we have good job creation and that we are removing barriers to job participation for black families. That kind of you know, trend data, if we have a universal goal, um, this idea of targeted universalism, if we have a universal goal of growth, then we need to make sure we are targeting our strategies to anything that gets in the way of everyone participating in that growth. And the kind of data we can get from the Atlas um, is very, very useful to helping devise those strategies and prioritize resource investment and, uh, and time investment. Um, so these are conversations of consequence internationally, but they are conversations of consequence on the block on which I live. And uh, having adequate data both to make the case for the kinds of strategies I want to employ and also guide the strategies that need employment uh, most significantly are two really important reasons that data are important. That's it. Thank you so much, Betsy, um, for joining us this morning. Now we're going to turn it over to Manuel Pastor, Director of the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at the University of Southern California. Manuel? We can't hear you. You might still be muted, so please unmute yourself if that's the case. I think we need to. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks, Manuel. OK. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to have a voice. Um, uh, super to be with you today. Very excited to uh, be uh, communicating about this national uh, equity atlas in the city layer. And I'm going to try to be brief so that we can quickly get to Pamela Stevens, one of the architects of this, to walk us through a bit of the data. But I do want to say three things. The first is that 
this new city layer, like the rest of the National Equity Atlas, is really embedded within a conversation about why equity matters. And our central argument in both the data um, and as we go around the country speaking about this is that equity and opportunity matter because when we think about this next generation and next demographic coming up, as Mayor Hodges was talking about, we need to make sure that people have on-ramps to opportunity so they can be as productive and contributing as much as possible as we move forward. The second reason why equity matters is there's an increasing set of studies from the Cleveland Federal Reserve, from the International Monetary Fund, and also from uh, this wonderful new book that's coming out in October uh, by Chris Benner and myself, Equity, Growth, and Community, uh, which actually will be available on October 12th. It will also be available free online for you to simply download and read. But there, too, what we're finding out is that those regions that are more equitable, have less residential segregation, have less divides between city and suburb, are regions that are able to grow more sustainably over time. So equity is important for its own sake. Equity is also important for sustainable economic growth. Normally, this argument about equity has often been made at a regional level. The studies by the Cleveland Federal Reserve, our own work, has tended to focus in on what happens at a metropolitan level. And so it makes sense that the first iteration of the National Equity Atlas made available all the states of the United States plus D.C. plus the 150 top metropolitan areas. But it, we also know that cities matter. They matter not only because of the places where people live and there's jurisdictions there, but it is America's cities which are on this very interesting comeback, and at the same time, they are the level at which policies are increasingly being tested and implemented to deal with issues of equity. So the minimum wage uh, struggles have taken place in key cities, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, and they're bubbling up to the regional, state, and hopefully national levels. When we look at our cities, it's our cities that are doing the work of making sure that community policing means not cooperating with immigration and customs enforcement and therefore gaining the trust of immigrant communities. It's our cities that are beginning to change the way that we do criminal justice. So cities matter because they're a catalyst for change in the broader region and beyond. They're hubs of innovation and they can really set sort of a tone and pace for the regions that they often anchor. The final thing, of course, that matters, and this makes sense from our group, we often think about ourselves as being nerds for social justice, is that data matters. Data matters for the reasons that Mayor Hodges was talking Wait, can about. Can the, um, the camera? Um, someone probably who just spoke wants to be muted, um, who talked about the camera. Um, the data matters because data, as Mayor Hodges was talking about, can better inform policy making to address equity issues. It helps us, as you'll see, to understand who are disconnected youth, who are unemployed. It helps us to devise appropriate policies. Um, it also matters because data helps to ground a conversation. When San Antonio, for example, with its marvelous effort, SA 2020, trying to take a look at data and project forward to the future, that data helps ground a conversation so that people can find from the data their common destiny. And so data doesn't solve all problems, but data can make sure that we're having a conversation about our common future, a conversation which helps to defuse ideology and move us toward solutions. Data also matters because it can reveal surprises. One of the things is that we often think we know what's going on in our region, but when the data lets us know who the disconnected youth are, when the data lets us know that when people think about immigrants, they tend to think about Latinos, but that the Asian community is actually more immigrant than the uh, Latino community, or that the Asian community, while it might have higher levels of household income, also has higher levels of poverty. It's the surprises in the data that can often lead us to be able to uh, understand what we need to do. And finally, data matters because data can be used to track progress on regional equity. 
One great thing we think about the National Equity Atlas is that it not only shows you the data, but it's embedded in a set of stories and policies about what people can do to move the needle on disparities. But you need to be able to track that over time. I'm going to hand things over to one who's been tracking this over time in a second, Pamela Stevens. She's going to walk us through the Atlas and uh, its architecture with this new uh, city layers. But I do want to say one thing about what's behind the curtain of the National Equity Atlas. Aside from the great website and the great collection of narrative and stories and policies, is a data system which is weaving together about six to seven to eight different databases, interweaving them into something that can track progress for America's metros and America's states and now America's regions from the 1980s to the current day. And what that's allowed us to do is not only create this website, but also have a set of background research that we can do, including recent work on what it would mean if we could actually bring the United States to full employment, how that would benefit everybody in the United States, but in particular benefit communities of color. It's allowing us to track issues like the racial generation gap. So behind what we're showing you is a kind of marvelous array of data that's also allowing for us to contribute along with PolicyLink in so many different ways to these struggles for equity and justice and opportunity and growth. And now let me hand things over to our uh, data analyst and data architect, uh, Pamela Stevens. Okay, thanks, Manuel. Um, okay, so hi, everyone. I'm excited to share the Atlas with you and explore our new city level data. So, in today's walkthrough, I'm going to demonstrate how the site works while highlighting our newly released data for the top 100 cities in the United States. So our team built the National Equity Atlas in order to democratize data, to put out relevant data to people working on the ground for change, and to provide data in the context of our equity as a superior growth model framework. And this is what makes the Atlas unique. It's a tool to provide advocates and policymakers with data and policy ideas to understand the changing demographics in their communities, measure and track the state of equity, and make the case for equitable growth. And as a data nerd, it's important for me to underscore the robustness of the data we provide. We provide data for 301 geographies, so the largest 150 regions, the top 100 cities, all 50 states, and the United States as a whole. We disaggregate these data by race and ethnicity for all of these geographies, and sometimes for nativity, gender, and other demographic characteristics. And we provide data at consistent geographies going back to 1980, as well as moving forward into demographic projections to 2040. And while we have 29 indicators on the site now, all cut in multiple ways, we're constantly working to expand our data. We're currently working on adding new indicators, new data sets, and additional cuts to the data, including the addition of subgroups for our race and ethnicity data. So now let's take a look at the atlas, starting with the home page. So the website is organized around the overarching framework of equitable growth, which is organized into three parts. So first, the face of America is changing. Inequality threatens economic prosperity. And equity is a superior growth model. And under each heading, we have some explanatory uh, narrative and an indicator to support the framing. So under the face of America is changing, we see the map of the share of people of color to show projections into 2040. The, the map shows the percent of people of color by county with the top 150 um, metro areas in the US outlined in black. And that how, highlights how demographic change is happening across the country. So from here, I'm going to jump right into the indicators section of the website. So as I mentioned earlier, we currently have 29 indicators available, so 23 available for the cities. And they're organized under three sections that mirror, mirror our narrative. So demographics, equity, which is further divided into economic vitality, readiness, and connectedness, and economic benefits. So first we land on the race and ethnicity indicator. So all of the indicators have the same basic structure. The first thing you'll notice is the main graphic display. 
And if you have any questions about what the indicator means, you can hover over this question mark button and you can get a definition of the indicator as well as a link to the technical documentation, which will answer any question you have about the data. So below the graphic, we include anything that an advocate or policymaker would need to be able to share these data um, and incorporate it into their work, something that sets the atlas apart from a lot of other data sites. So you can download the graphic um, for your own presentation and um, advocacy work or share the graphics via social media. And then moving down, here on the left, we have a framing question uh, which helps you understand what you're looking for in the, in the indicator. And then below the question, there's some language describing the key data points from the graphic display. And then on the right, we have the why it matters statement, which tells us why we should care about these data, what it means for equitable growth, and why addressing the data shown in the indicator is beneficial for us all. And moving further down, we include strategies for addressing what the data shows, an example box um, of a strategy in action, and some additional resources and links to data because we want to connect the data to actual policies that can be put in place. So going back to the main um, graphic display, this indicator shows that the population in the United States is moving toward being majority people of color. And then when we look at the con contribution to growth by people of color, we can see in absolute numbers what this growth looks like. So people of color are the top orange bar and whites are the bottom gray bar. And you'll notice that throughout the indicator pages that the colors used to represent groups are pretty consistent. So we can move forward and look at 2010 to 2040 to see, sorry for the delay. There must be a lot of people on the site right now. Um, so you can see moving forward that the contributions uh, to growth uh, from people of color will continue and eventually the white population will actually start shrinking. And so we can look at uh, population growth rates to see who's driving that growth. Hi, Pamela, this is yeah. Sarah. Yeah. A lot of folks are not able to see the site for some reason, so what we're going to do is Eugene at PolicyLink is going to restart the share, so I think you should go back and start right from the beginning because people weren't seeing it. So Eugene, please let us know when we should start. Okay. Pamela, you want to try and share your screen now? Um, I just clicked the share screen okay. thing. Is it not sharing? Okay, it looks like. Uh, huh? Okay, it looks like people are able to see it now. Okay, but it looks. Okay, but it looks like the site is on the fritz. Yeah. Okay. Can you give me okay? Yeah. Okay, some folks were able to see the site the whole time, but others were not and were writing into us. So um, so we restarted it, and sorry for those of you who will hear this again, but for those of you who were not able to see it, you'll get to hear it another time. We'll still have time for questions. So go ahead, Pamela. Okay, so I'm gonna so I'm gonna start um, going through the site, starting from the home page again. Um, and I just want to apologize in advance for the delay. It seems like a lot of people are on the site right now, so um, I just want to warn you about that. So again, um, the the Starting at the home page, the website is uh, organized around the overarching framework of equitable growth, which is organized into three parts. So the face of America is changing, 
Inequity threatens economic prosperity, and equity is the superior growth model. So under each heading, we have some um, explanatory narrative and an indicator to support the framing. So under the face of America is changing, we see the map of the share of people of color to show projections into 2040. So the map shows the percent people of color by county with the top 150 metropolitan regions in the U.S. outlined in black. And it highlights how demographic change is happening across the country. So from here, I'm going to jump back into the indicator section of the website. So just to recap, uh, we have 29 indicators available, 23 of which are available at the city level. And they're organized under three sections that mirror our narrative. So demographics, equity, which is um, divided into economic vitality, readiness, and connectedness, and economic benefits. So the first indicator that we land on is the race and ethnicity indicator. And all of the indicator pages have the same basic structure. So the first thing you'll notice is the main graphic display. And if you have questions about the indicator, you can look at this question mark button and it'll give a definition of the indicator. And it also uh, links you to the technical documentation, which will answer any questions that you can have about the data. So below the graphic, we include everything that an advocate or policymaker would need to be, to be able to share these data and incorporate it into their work. And this sets uh, the atlas apart from a lot of other data sites. So on the left, so we have um, the opportunity to download the graphics for your own presentations and advocacy work or share the, the graphics via social media. So moving further down, on the left we have a framing question which helps you understand what you're looking for in the data. And below that question we have language describing the key data points from the graphic display. Then on the right we have the why it matters statement which tells us why we should care about the data. Um, in the indicator, what it means for equitable growth, and why address addressing these data um, is beneficial for us all. And moving down, we include strategies for addressing what the data shows, an example box of the strategy in action, and some additional resources and links to data, because we want to connect the data to actual, actual policies that could be put in place. So going back to the main graphic display, um, we can see that the United States is moving towards being majority people of color. And then we can look at this, the contribution to growth um, in, of people of color in absolute numbers and see what that change looks like. So people of color are the top orange bar and whites are the bottom gray bar. And you, you'll notice that throughout the indicator pages that the colors used to represent groups that are pretty consistent. So moving forward, we can click to 2010 to 2040 and see that people of color um, will continue to drive growth and we can see what those contributions will be. And we also see that the white population will actually start to shrink. So we can look at the population growth rates to see which groups are driving that growth. And we see that Latinos and Asians, seen in blue and green, are driving that growth. And these groups will continue to drive growth. So these are largely immigrant groups. So let's drill down even further and look at contribution to growth by immigrants. And we can look at this by race. So when we look at um, the Latino growth, we can see actually the Latino growth is being driven by US born Latinos, which are seen in orange. So this is contrary to popular belief as um, Manuel mentioned. And we can see for Asians that the growth is being driven by immigrants, which are seen in gray. So these demographic indicators um, lay the groundwork for the importance of equitable growth. So now let's explore the city data by looking at some equity indicators. So first, I'm going to start with the $15 an hour minimum wage or wage indicator. So this indicator speaks to the advocacy around the $15 an hour minimum wage. 
which has happened at smaller scales in the region or state. So we'll look at this for um, Los, the city of Los Angeles. Okay, so then let me select it. Okay, here we go. So we're looking at LA because LA is one of the cities that um, has passed the $15 an hour minimum wage law, recognizing that the current $9 an hour minimum wage isn't a livable wage, especially as housing costs in the city continue to rise. So the main graphic display has us looking at the share of workers earning at least $15 an hour over time. And we can see that the gap between white workers and workers of color has widened over time. So by year, we, when we look at this by year, we can see that in 20, I'm sorry everyone, it's so glitchy. Um, so, so when we look at this for 2012, we can, we should be able to look at this by 2012. Okay, we can see that the uh, that eighty percent of whites earned at least fifteen dollar an hour, a share significantly higher than all other racial and ethnic groups. So when we look at this by education, and it'll pop up soon. This time, hopefully it'll. It'll be the, the right one. Okay, so when we, when we look at this by education, we can see that disparities exist while controlling for education level, although we can see that they do get smaller as education levels get higher. And then finally, we can look at this by gender. Okay, and we see that overall a slightly higher share of women, which are this, this top pink bar, earn at least $15 an hour, um, possibly due to higher education levels for women in the city. But you'll also see that white men have the highest share across race, ethnicity, and gender groups in the city. So moving forward, let's look at disconnected youth, which are the share of 16 to 24 year olds not working or in school. So this indicator highlights uh, the future prospect of youth as per, our participants in the workforce. There must be a lot of people on the site right now, which is great. Um, Okay, so we'll look at uh, disconnected youth for the city of Washington, D.C. Bear with me. So the first thing that the graphic shows is the, the total number of disconnected youth um, and the share that are youth of color versus white youth. So here we can see that the number of disconnected youth in Washington, D.C. has declined since 1990, but it has increased since 2000. And youth of color have consistently made up a large share of disconnected youth in Washington, D.C. So when we look at this by race and ethnicity, we, we can see that youth of color are much more likely to be disconnected than white youth. So for example, the share of black youth seen in this orangey red color um, are, more, are nine times more likely to be disconnected than white youth. 
And then we can also look at rankings to see how Washington, D.C. compares to the remaining top 100 cities. So overall, the ranking for Washington, D.C. falls in the middle, so it ranks number 47. So a higher ranking indicates a higher share of disconnected youth. So we can also look at how the share for white youth ranks, and we'll see that it drops all the way down to 96, indicating that the overall ranking is probably um, driven by youth of color. And we can prove it by looking at the ranking for people of color. And the ranking shoots up all the way to 16. So the issue of disconnected youth in D.C. Um, is disproportionately experienced by youth of color. So now I'm going to move into neighborhood poverty, which I think is a pretty compelling indicator at the city level. And I think you'll see why when I show it to you. Moving. Okay, so here we are. Um, so I'm gonna so I'm gonna look at this for the city of Detroit. And just to briefly explain what neighborhood poverty is, it's the share of people living in high poverty neighborhoods. Um, which we further define as census tracts with poverty rate of 40% or higher. So I'm going to pull this up to Detroit. Hmm? Okay, so while we're waiting for Detroit to come up, oh, well, I might be speaking too soon. I think it's about to load. But I think we have a little bit of delay. But in the meantime, we can look at DC and we can see that neighborhood poverty is pretty, pretty high overall in the in the the rate, so 11% for all seen in purple, is probably driven by the neighborhood poverty experienced by the black community. But when we look at Detroit, <laughs> we can see that uh, the neighborhood poverty rates are pretty astounding. And they're pretty significantly high for, um, group, or for whites and Asians, which is pretty um, surprising. And we can look at how neighborhood poverty has changed over time, going back to 2000. And we can see that um, neighborhood poverty has jumped pretty, um, pretty, or by a lot between 2000 and 2012. So in 2000, the neighborhood poverty rate overall was about 9%. And then when we switch back to 2012, it shoots all the way up to 41%. And we can look at this even further um, by comparing the city level to the region as a whole. I'm going to type in Detroit into the compare option. Here we go. Okay, so the, we can see how the city as a whole, or how the city compares to the region as a whole. 
So the city is seen on the top and the region is seen on the bottom in pink. And we can see that the city rates are much higher than the region as a whole. And for those groups that had really surprising neighborhood poverty rates, so whites and Asians, we can see that the rates went down pretty substantially um, at the regional level, indicating that neighborhood poverty or poverty is concentrated for these groups at the, in, at the city level. But then when we look at the black community in Detroit, we can see that the disparity between the city and the region is not as wide, kind of indicating that the issue of neighborhood poverty is pervasive throughout the, the metro area. So the equity indicators highlight barriers that growing communities of color face. So now let's look at the economic benefits indicators. So I'm going to start by looking at the GDP gains with racial equity. So this indicator highlights our GDP analysis, which shows what the GDP would look like um, if, if all racial groups had similar income levels as non-Hispanic whites. So because economies move at the regional level, we don't provide this data at the city level, which you can kind of make out here. So I'm going to show you this data for the San Francisco Bay Area. So the region's actual GDP is on the left in blue. And the projected GDP is um, on the is in green on the right. And here we see that um, if the Bay Area had racial equity and income, um, the economy would be about 117 billion dollars larger, about a 30 percent increase in the region's GDP. And if we want to explore the economic benefits of racial equity at the city level we have the opportunity to explain or explore the income gains with racial equity indicator, which builds off this GDP analysis. And just to explain it a little further, we estimated the income gains by assuming that each racial and ethnic group had the same age-adjusted average annual income, income distribution, and employment levels as non-Hispanic whites. So I'm going to show you um, this at the city level for a city in the Bay Area. I'm going to pick Oakland. And here you can see that all groups stand to see significant gains with racial equity. So we can look at this as, as actual values or as percentage gains. And here we see that incomes will more than double for most groups when we have racial equity and income. And finally, we can look at the source of gains. So whether the gains in income would come from increases in wages or would, if they would come from um, increases in employment. So we can see variation across uh, racial and ethnic groups. So the disparities that Latinos and Asians have are mainly driven by wages, while for, uh, for black and multiracial folks, uh, the disparities come from wages and employment fairly equally. So that was just a quick look at the indicator section, and there are so many more to explore. So we recognize that it's really hard to know where to start in terms of looking at these data, so we also have data summaries. I'm just going to click on that. So the data summaries provide your state, region, or city's equitable growth story in six charts and follows the three-part equity as a superior growth model narrative that we have throughout the atlas. So these summaries are available for every ge geography in the database. So I'm going to select a city, Atlanta. So for the region, or for region, cities, and states, we include the national data as a reference point to understand how communities compared to the national trend. So you can see here for the city of Atlanta um, that the population is already a majority of people of color. And, it actually, and it's been like that for a long time. And we can see that it's actually becoming wider. 
which kind of is, is different than the national trend. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole summary, but these summaries are a great tool for advocates and policymakers to start having conversations about demographic change and equity in their communities. So the rest of the website provides even more information and resources about equitable growth. So first I'm going to point to the report section. which is where we house our equity profiles and our latest reports that we've produced. Okay, using, using our um, regional equity indicators database. So here are the profiles. Okay, here are the profiles, and then here are our latest analyses. Which includes um, our latest analysis, analysis, which estimates the economic benefits of full employment across race and gender groups, which was done to support the Set Up campaign. So next, I'm going to point you to the data and action piece of the website. And this section includes stories about how communities are using equ equity data to drive policy development and change and foster new conversations about equity and regional futures. And we also include information about updates to the site, new indicators and data sets, and articles with ideas about how to use and analyze these data. And then finally, we have the About the Atlas or section. Okay, so in this section, we um, include background on the project, um, information about our team, the data methods, for um, that which provides information about our database and analytical framework, technical information about our methods, and the full list of the largest 150 metropolitan regions and 100 cities. And then we have the res our resources, which list, um, which includes lists of other national and local equity data resources, as well as the growing body of research and evidence supporting the economic case for equity and inclusion. So I'm just going to end by underscoring my earlier point that the National Equity Atlas is a living resource and we're continuing to add new indicators and new cuts of data on an ongoing basis. So our next update will include further disaggregation of our race and ethnicity data by subgroup because we recognize that some groups like Asians and Pacific Islanders are very diverse. In our constant efforts to improve the atlas, we hope to ensure that we can meet the needs of local leaders and advocates trying to move forward um, toward more inclusive and equitable growth in their communities. So thank you all for letting me share this tool with you, and I'll turn it back to Sarah for questions and answers. Thank you so much, Pamela, for walking us through um, the data. I know folks are excited to go look at it, or I hope you're excited to go look at it. Um, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and there have been some questions coming in about the data itself, and so I was going to turn it over to Justin Scoggins to answer this question, which is about where where does the data come from? Are these publicly available data sets? Can people access that data? If you could address that, Justin, that would be great. And also, Pamela, just so you know, I'm going to leave. We're going to leave the atlas open on your screen in case some of the questions. Um, you know, in case it would be useful to go to the Atlas to answer the question. So, Justin, you might need to unmute yourself. Aha, much better. Hi, I'm Justin Scoggins, uh, one of the architects behind the data that, that supports the Atlas. Um, so, as far as the sources of the data, they're all, they're mostly public, some private sources. 
um, including the Integrated Public Use Microdata System, or IPUMS, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau Geolytics, which is private, Woods and Pole Economics, which is private, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and I think that about covers it. Um, so while we pull uh, data from a lot of different places, uh, many of the equity indicators are actually based upon an individual level data that's known as microdata um, that comes from the American Community Survey, or ACS. Um, so while most people access kind of summary tables from American Fact Finder, we download the full kind of individual level uh, responses uh, to kind of create a lot of these sort of custom uh, indicators. Um, you know, so for example, the, the, you can get a lot more detail, like our indicator on disconnected youth by race ethnicity um, focuses on the people ages 16 to 24 who are neither working or in school and is not really available in the ACS summary files until very recently. Um, so one, you know, while using the microdata allows us to create a lot of really interesting indicators, uh, one uh, kind of limitation uh, in using it is geography. We're really only a, a bit able to provide data for kind of lar larger geographies, which is why, you know, we've had to limit to the largest 100 cities, largest 150 metropolitan areas. I think that kind of background on the data. If there's uh, more questions on it, I'm happy to answer more. Thank you, Justin. I'm sure we'll come back to you because people do have a lot of questions about the data. But I'm going to ask Pamela if she could say a little bit more about how the Asian Pacific Islander um, category is defined. Someone said that they that, let me come back to the question, um, that they anticipated that that category would be 10% 10, 10 of the population by 2040, um, but our data just shows 8%. So is that because of how APIs are counted? Um, so if you could speak to that, and then also someone asked about the source of our projections data, so if you could share that source. Yeah, sorry, I missed the beginning of that question. Um, so I could probably take that question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Justin. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, one reason, maybe, so our, our projections are, um, for nationally, we use the, the census's latest 2014 national population projections. Uh, so if there's a difference nationally, um, it's likely because we're looking at a non-Hispanic Asian Pacific Islander um, and not uh, kind of all everyone who answered uh, Asian or Pacific Islander to the race question, which might include some Latinos. Um, when we go down to regions, we use projections uh, at the county le level from uh, Woods and Pohl Economics Incorporated out of Washington, D.C. Um, and when we, you know, we make slight adjustments to those projections because they count the, um, you know, their data, people who mark um, other race alone, which is a very tiny fraction of the population. Um, are distributed across the other racial groups, but in the the the, the race data we present, um, that group, other race alone, are included in the other multiracial. So they're pretty much the same. But we take we use our county county level projections to build up to uh, metropolitan areas, and then make adjustments so that everything is consistent with the census's national projections. And the Asian Pacific Islander category uh, does include uh, Pacific Islanders, even though the label just says Asian. Another question that people always have in looking at this is, so we're adding data on the 100 largest cities, which is great for the people who live in the 100 largest cities. <laughs> um, but will we be able to add or provide data at the county level or for rural areas? What, what would you tell them, Justin? Um, so as I mentioned, that a lot of the kind of rich uh, equity indicators come from this, uh, the microdata, which again, we're limited in terms of geographic scope. Um, you know, we're currently working on uh, trying to expand kind of our, uh, our kind of census tract level uh, mapping data, um, which, you know, has kind of, you know, less detailed indicators, um, but is very detailed in terms of geography. Um, and you know, once we have that data available, it would you could examine um, kind of all the census tracts uh, in your state or county, for example. If uh, I but, might add something to this as well, Manuel, 
which I think that uh, it's something that Sarah said before, is that we really see this as being value added to a bunch of other uh, data systems that are out there. And so one of the things that we've tried to do, I mean, we think we've added a lot of value by having such disaggregated data by race, uh, ethnicity, nativity, gender, by combining these different data sets together, by weaving this inside of a story and with projections. But we're also aware that there's many great efforts out there, Healthy City from the Advancement Project, uh, stuff from the Brookings Institution, from so many other organizations. And so as we add data, we're always asking the question, are we adding value or can we simply refer people to other locations so that we can help support a broader ecosystem of data development uh, for social equity? Thank you so much, Manuel. That's perfect. Um, and we are excited to find those value-added indicators. And one thing to note is that we're when you close out of this webinar, there will be a survey. And if you know of data that you want, and some of you have been writing in, please tell us, because we put that into the mix and try to be demand driven. Um, so on to more questions. Uh, folks are asking about um, the benchmarks for equity. So um, are non-Hispanic whites always the default benchmark for equity definitions, or are these definitions driven by the best indicator in a given category? Would one of you like to answer that? Maybe Manuel? So I'll let Justin address that. Justin, uh, okay. Because I, I think we've done that differently for employment and, uh, uh, and for the income. Justin? Um, I think that you know, in terms of benchmarks, it's really hard to say. It, it, it could, you know, it could be different <clears throat> um, for different indicators. Um, for our GDP analysis of kind of what, how much GDP would increase if there were uh, equity by race and in income and employment, we use non-Hispanic whites as the benchmark just because that they're typically the group with the highest income levels. Um, they've been used in uh, kind of uh, research on kind of immigrant integration as sort of the benchmark as the most sort of assimilated group. Um, for our full employment analysis, we actually set uh, kind of, be we used benchmarks of full employment. Um, you know, people typically think of between four and five and a half percent unemployment rate as full employment, but that analysis actually um, applies that rate to each and every uh, race and gender group. Um, and so the analysis sort of assumes a scenario of full employment for all. Um, for other indicators, there, there are a variety of benchmarks, and it's, so it's really sort of, um, you know, we, we don't know what exactly the right benchmarks are. I think that the, the equity atlas is really, is more, at least at this point, is more focused on economic equity. Um, so we tend to focus on economic measures. One thing I would add to that is that for the full employment indicators, uh, we also looked at uh, what are called labor force participation rates. Because one of the biggest things that's happened, particularly for African Americans, but for many other kind of workers, is the discouraged worker phenomena, in which people have been out of the labor force for such a long time that they're no longer looking for work, so they don't get counted in the unemployment statistics. So in those benchmarks, we also try to return to historically high um, average uh, labor force participation rates. I would like to reassure people, though, that if a group was actually doing better, for example, had lower unemployment that, than the full employment, we did not use this uh, benchmarking exercise as an excuse to throw them out of a job. Uh, we allowed them if they had better than uh, optimal performance to continue to have that. Okay, thank you so much, Manuel. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you, Pamela, for walking us through the site. I want to encourage you all to explore the data, to go see the data for your city, and to answer the survey that you're going to see that pops up on your screen when you exit the webinar and let us know how we can support you in using that data and continuing to improve the Equity Atlas. Also, a quick reminder to um, come to the Equity Summit, where we will be talking more about equity data, sharing new tools, and talking about how people are using it for community change and inclusive growth. 
thanks so much, everybody.